Since late 2020, I've been publishing on average at least one video per week on this channel as a public service to aspiring computer scientists. Why? Clearly not for the money, as the channel, although in theory monetized, is still heavily in the red and only grows at a snail's pace. Fiona Holland is the head of communications at Trinity College Cambridge, and in this video she grills me on why I would be so crazy as to sink all this time, effort and money into this channel. Morning, Good Frank. Good morning, Fiona. Thank you. <laughs> nice Thank to you see for you. Coming. Yes. Thank you for agreeing to it. So the first question is, um, why did you start this video series? So this video series with uh, talking to the students in the context of my YouTube channel, which I started when I published my lectures online since I was doing them for the pandemics, we couldn't have lectures with students, so I had to make videos. And I said, well, if I'm doing the videos, uh, so much effort goes into making the videos well that I'd rather share them with more people than just the hundred who would otherwise come to my class. So since as uh, university teaching officers of the University of Cambridge, we have the copyright and performance rights of our lectures, I'm free to do what I want and what I want is share them with the world. So that's how the YouTube channel itself started and this particular series about um, uh, chatting with the students started was because, um, well, why am, I, why am I here in the first place? Uh, I'm here because um, I, I had a career in industry before this uh, and then I decided at some point when a chance to be a lecturer here came up I grabbed it because I felt uh, in my heart uh, that uh, education is uh, one of the most important things and that uh, it was a thrill for me to um, help people grow. A thrill? A thrill mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. I, I could uh, see talented people and help them become better than they were mm -hmm. uh, and it was quite exciting for me and I, and I found that that was my my call I mean of course I make a lot more money <laughs> if I use my computer science uh, uh, abilities uh, in industry as I used to mm -hmm. uh, but I get more satisfaction out of what I do here and more freedom and more contact with the uh, people that I uh, then make a difference in the life of uh, and I, I, I mean, I have this uh, feeling towards uh, doing what I do to the point that uh, I am a professor. I'm paid as a professor in my day job, but in my spare time, in the evenings, I'm also an educator on a volunteer basis as a martial arts instructor. And, and there, too, I help people grow to their potential. And it's uh, just as satisfying as it is to, with, with the students here. So today is a um, graduation day, so we see all the students going out and uh, in, in their gowns and stuff, and it's a day to celebrate the growth that they've had in these, um, these years here, and it's going to be the like harvest time where we go and congratulate their parents on how good their students are and so on and, so on and send them off in the world. Anyway, so that's a long-winded uh, intro to say uh, I, I think education is one of the most important and fundamental things that uh, we can do to make the world better, uh, inspiring and uh, guiding a new generation. And my belief is that we ought to give this opportunity to talent wherever it is found. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there are plenty of myths about Cambridge and about Trinity uh, around the fact that you know, it's only a place for rich white boys. And if you look at it from outside very superficially, you see plenty more rich white boys in Cambridge than you see in the general population. And this kind of reinforces this myth. Uh, but it is absolutely not true that we pick the rich white boys to come here. Uh, what we, what, I, I'm an admissions officer for my subject, right? And, and how I pick people is not uh, by wealth or race or uh, gender or any of these other things, it's by uh, whether they're brilliant. I don't care where they look like, where they come from, or what their native languages. I mean, English is only my third language for myself. Uh, and I want to dispel those myths that would otherwise stop talented people from applying because they think they don't have a chance because they're not a rich white boy. So if you're not rich, or you're not white, or you're not a boy, if you're brilliant, and if you love, in my case, computer science, mm -hmm. then this could be the place for you. This could be the place that makes you happy. And I want to convey this message from someone who is not just hand-waving and talking about stuff that they... It's someone who actually does the admissions. I'm the one who does the admissions. And I don't care what you look like. I only care that you are brilliant. 
that if I take you in and you become my student, then you have the talent and the potential to become even more brilliant. And then I will be delighted to have you here with me and make you progress. And I will be proud of you when on a day like this, I meet your parents and say, your daughter, your son has done very well. Shake your hand, well done, go off into the world. Yeah. So that's the reason for doing this series. Now, I can say this till I'm blue in the face, but I'm, I'm an old fogey and I'm white and I'm male and so on. And so if I want to, so I'm not particularly rich, especially as I took the <laughs> education route instead of the industrial route, but that's another story. Um, if I want to inspire those people, I thought maybe it's best to have a role model which is closer to them than I am. I mean, I can be the mentor, but you can have an example of someone who's not rich or not white or not male uh, and hear it from their own voice. And so, um, I mean, you can try to fix everything in the world. And I started by focusing on the gender imbalance, which is particularly um, skewed in computer science um, and uh, uh, so I asked the brilliant female students that we have in Trinity if they would be willing to do some videos with me uh, and they uh, I think practically all said yes they were happy to contribute and to tell their story uh, in the spirit of inspiring other uh, young girls like them and say well don't be afraid of all these rumors because they're not true. I made it uh, and you can make it. Uh, and uh, it's not as scary as people who don't have a clue make it sound. And I think that uh, this is a very, um, very small contribution uh, that we are making, but it's an important one. You've answered some of my questions already. So I'm going to jump on a bit. Um, ultimately, what do you hope to achieve by the whole series, say, looking forward a couple of years? Well, uh, I am not deluding myself that I'm going to uh, make a, a, a very big difference in the whole world, given the fact that my channel is tiny. It's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm keeping at it with one video per week. I've been doing this since uh, the end of 2020, but it's still a very small thing with just, uh, you know, uh, 3,000 subscribers we have now. Uh, we have a few hundred views per video. When it goes to uh, a thousand, it's a kind of a cause for celebration. So not very many people view these videos at all. So I don't think that it's going to make a big difference. But I'm I'm keeping at it in the hope that one day it will be um, seen by many more people. It will be reaching many more people, uh, and then at that point. Uh, it can have an influence. At the moment, the people who watch these particular videos in this series are just people who want to get into Cambridge specifically and want to get some clues, some tips. But I think that this is a message in my heart that should go out to people regardless of where they want to go to university is to say, well, okay, you're 12, 13, 14. Uh, start thinking that if you're good at this, mm. it's in the cards for you. You could do it. It could be brilliant. It could be the best thing I mean, it's not for everyone, but there are people who have these, these gifts, these talents, and unless they are cultivated at that age, then when they decide what to, what to do at the university at 17, it's too late. I mean, they have had to prepare if they want to have a chance to do something good there. And we have to send them the inspiration and the confidence that it could work for them, even if they're not rich or white or boys. So have you changed your target audience, do you think, over the time you've been doing this to younger people who may not necessarily come to Cambridge but might think about computer science at any other university? Uh, yes, I would, I would hope to uh, reach those people. Uh, I am looking at the statistics and analytics of my channel and I am aware that, first of all, my channel is very small, as I already said, but also that... Uh, of the people who watch my channel, what Google believes about them is that only 5% of them are female uh, and only less than 1% of them are less than 18. So uh, most of the videos that I do speak to young girls who are 12, 13, 14, 15 in theory, mm -hmm. but I don't think that very many of these are viewed by those uh, and they're mostly viewed by um, maybe young boys who want to come to Cambridge or something like that. And 
I mean, the message is good for them too. I mean, I mean some of them are, are, are not, not white or not rich and so on. So it's all still good. Mm -hmm. uh, and it will still inspire some, um, some of them into doing something they might otherwise have felt was not for them. So it is still serving its purpose, but I don't think I have yet found a way to just get the videos in front of my intended target audience of young girls. Uh, and I've done some other forms of outreach, including working with schools or mm -hmm. uh, other initiatives that people smarter than me have started. And, and they say, would you like to speak at this? Yeah, sure, I'll give an hour for that. But, you know, trying to expand the reach in some way. I, I don't think I have uh, a solution yet, but I, I'm still, I mean, the videos that we do, they will stay there forever. So if one day the channel reaches this wider audience, then they will be there for them to yeah. see. Yeah. Um, what's been the reaction from the people who are watching your videos? Um, some, I think the reaction has been generally good. I mean, it, it's also self-selecting audience, the people who are bored, they stop after the, the, the first 30 seconds and don't watch the rest, but those who stay until the end are the people who are interested by this kind of stuff. Um, there's uh, many queries which are very, uh, very narrow-minded and low-level. Oh, I've got this, uh, you know, A star, B, whatever. Would I still get admitted? What should I do? Blah, blah. And you, know, you just direct those to the <laughs> admissions office. Uh, uh, and, so, you know, some people take me doing these, um, these videos about uh, 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 outreach and admissions as a kind of direct chat with someone who knows how the system works. And that's not the purpose of these. Um, uh, and so, you know, you respond politely, but, but that's it. Yeah. Um, uh, and others uh, are seeing this as, uh, oh, yes, this is um, actually uh, something that, I mean, the thing that gave me the most satisfaction about this particular series is that uh, I then do the admissions and I get a young woman saying, uh, I watched your videos and this gave me the confidence to apply to Trinity, which I would not have otherwise done. So, so yeah, that's there's not very many yeah. who apply, but the few who did apply then told me that they had watched the videos and that, that had encouraged them. And do you think they were encouraged to apply to Cambridge generally, or they were already going to apply to Cambridge and they applied to Trinity because they saw your video? Well, it's not the same for all of them, but uh, the, I, I had, uh, and this is, this is not on a statistical basis, but just on an anecdotal uh, basis, uh, uh, women tell me uh, I decided to apply here because I saw the video and particularly you know that student of yours called Anna that was a great video blah blah blah. Okay. Mm, interesting yeah that's pretty good feedback yeah yeah I mean it, it, again it's, you know, it's one out of how yes. many but uh, just that one is enough for me to keep going. I mean this question is not on my list but I didn't realize you're putting a lot of work effort and, and time into this um, I understand why you're saying you're going to keep going in the future. Uh, did you anticipate it would be that much effort at the outset? Uh, no, not at all. So at the beginning, when I started, I started because um, of the pandemic, okay, COVID-19, we could not meet anybody, colleagues or students or anyone uh, outside your bubble, your family, whatever. Uh, and so we could not lecture, right? So the mm. students uh, had to <clears throat> have some course and so we were uh, requested forced to uh, do videos that would be offered to the students in substitution for lectures now i am um, as people in this line of business uh, sometimes are uh, a bit of a stickler and a perfectionist and if i'm doing something uh, that's going to stay out uh, mm -hmm. it's not ephemeral like a lecture that you, you give and then you go away then if it's going to stay there, I want it to be done the way I want it, right? And so I was not happy with just recording something as it came out and then sticking it uh, mm -hmm. on some server. And I, uh, I then decided, and I, and I had wanted to do that for a long time, but always postponed it because you know, there was no time to do it. And I, so I had already been recording myself giving lectures for years before COVID, but I just mm. never had the time to you know, edit it or do anything oh, presentable because... Uh, having done it, I can say it takes about uh, 20 hours of work for every hour that you put out. Um, and so, you know, where do I find this extra 20 hours <laughs> with my, my normal job? But now we were forced to do it. So, okay, I'm going to put in the work. I started learning how to 
do video editing, which I meant to do, but never got around mm -hmm. to. Um, and then I started editing some of the material that I had already captured pre-COVID and making lectures out of this, of course, integrating it with extra bits that were necessary. Uh, and of course, I was new to this, so it was all a bit rubbish, but I did the best I could do uh, to put this out. Uh, and I could see other universities had been doing videos for a long time, the most famous university in the world, you know, Harvard and mm -hmm. MIT and so on and so on. And there was you know, MIT channel, millions of views on university lectures. So there's obviously an audience of people who want to watch quality uh, university lectures and I said okay I put my lectures there and there's gonna be you know millions of views that MIT has I mean my lectures are not any uh, any less good than, than those ones uh, and instead as I started doing YouTube I understood that's not how YouTube works uh, and so you have this channel and people have to tune into your channel they, to do that they have to discover your channel and to discover your channel YouTube has to uh, suggest to them that it exists and it only does that on a kind of a positive feedback loop that more people watch it and more people suggest so it's difficult to get started and get recommended by the algorithm of YouTube and unless you are drip feeding something that keeps people coming back then if you just put a bunch of lectures they can be the best lectures in the world they could be lectures of you know uh, Feynman but if they're static and you can't you, you don't keep adding stuff then Yep. nobody will go back to the channel mm. and so I said okay at that point I made a, a deal with myself of committing to uh, doing a video per week to keep this alive uh, and uh, see where this uh, would take me and of course then besides my lectures which were done more or less in bulk uh, then I had to come up with stuff to do uh, week by week and so I, uh, I said okay well I, I give plenty of advice to my students as a director of studies I can share some of that with other people who I'm for whom I'm not a director of studies but could benefit from similar advice you know what should you do after your degree what's the deal with the PhD you know, all, all these kind of mm -hmm. things that I discuss with, with my mm -hmm. students and so I, I share this and let's see if other people are interested or other topics in computer science for people who are not at university maybe they're just professional programmers anyway you try these things and then this outreach series came out of that uh, and uh, it was nice to have this conversation with your students they also enjoyed themselves giving something back because uh, I mean these are clever people they're also good people and, and they, they 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 love uh, being in a position of uh, being able to help the younger version of themselves mm. uh, some of these uh, students that uh, have done videos with me for, for example uh, even at 20 were mentoring um, girl competitions in programming hackathons and stuff like that and so on. and so it was uh, fitting their own purpose and goals to do some outreach in the context of this and I had all the setup so for them it was just you know come here and speak for half an hour with me uh, and I did all the rest of it is good for both so you're doing something that is maybe a little bit unusual for a professor at Cambridge being involved in outreach and obviously you've got the right background to work out how the algorithms work and I can see it's a challenge that you enjoy uh, doing all this. Um, I suppose in modern contemporary times people have very short attention spans and they're used to things being very quick and you've said that for some people are watching 30 seconds and disappearing. Have you thought about experimenting with much shorter videos to see if you can increase your audience and gain more followers for your channel? Yeah, well, it's all uh, it's all a game that needs to be played to to reach your purpose, mm. and you know, there's not much uh, intelligent stuff that you can say in in, in a minute. But uh, YouTube itself, uh, being in competition with TikTok, which was threatening its position, decided to make this shorts format uh, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just a little after I had started getting into YouTube that uh, YouTube propose this format of shorts which are things that are less than a minute mm -hmm. uh, and so I dabbled into it I made uh, some short videos in fact one of the first shorts that I made was not about computer science was about uh, Japanese swordsmanship which is the thing I teach in the evenings uh, so I did a, a video about kendo and it shot up <laughs> magically to being the most watched thing on my whole channel I mean never mind computer science <laughs> so um, I don't know uh, if this attracted people who then watched the computer science videos or they, you know, they saw the rest of the channel and said this is all a load of rubbish from <laughs> university stuff I don't care about I, I don't know but uh, I've tried to extract bits from 
uh, longer videos as a kind of a teaser, like a trailer of a movie, uh, and say, well, uh, if that grabbed your attention as you were scrolling the, the shorts, then there's the full video over there. I, I don't really know that this is making a difference, but I'm trying, trying everything, so I'm, I am uh, making little videos out of stuff. I mean, I did a long interview with one of my students uh, who had, um, so she's called Elizabeth. She, um, I did an interview with her before she even came to Cambridge, just after she had been admitted. She received the admission the, uh, offer, whatever it's called, mm -hmm. letter. Uh, and um, because she was such a, you know, bubbling, enthusiastic character, I asked if she would come on the channel. It was still, still during COVID, still only Zoom. I'd never seen her in person. Uh, and she said yes, and she did a, a video, and it was, uh, I think, the most viewed of all these ones interviewed with students. Mm -hmm. And so then, when we were here, and we had actually met in person, and we'd done supervisions and blah, 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 I said, uh, Elizabeth, would you like to do another video? And she, she said, yes. And we spoke for almost an hour, and I was sure, okay, this one-hour video is going to be too long. I mean, nobody's going to watch one-hour video. And then I started taking... First, you know, would have taken me ages to edit, so I postponed that because I had other things to do. Also, it was not the time that people uh, prepare for admissions because it was in, in, in December or January or something like that. And so I said, if I put it out now, nobody's going to watch, so let's wait until people are ready for, for that, and I'll, I'll do the proper editing later. But in the meantime, I picked out little segments, little, uh, you know, less than one minute things, uh, where she was saying interesting things. And she, she, you know, a really bright, uh, bright student and a very, very energetic, enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. So she came across very well. So I did several small videos from that long interview with her. Uh, and then now, recently, uh, sometime in the past month, I, I published the whole thing. And I like to think, although I don't really know, that people uh, who had maybe seen those shorts finally were happy to see the whole thing that this had been extracted out of. Just as an aside, do you think the analytics that you can look at are of sufficient usefulness to you, or would you like them to be better? Uh, well, I think that they uh, they are much more detailed than anything we would uh, have on, let's say, a university-based platform. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, because my channel is still so small, uh, they don't really have much statistical value. I mean, right. uh, if, if I had... Uh, 100,000 uh, people who subscribe, then the, the numbers that come out of the analytics would have some meaning, whereas here they're just hints, but they don't really say that much. So I, I take them with a pinch of salt. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I can see which videos are more popular, but uh, I haven't reached that critical mass where things uh, become self-sustaining. And sometimes a video will do, uh, you know, the first day, lots of people start watching it and then lots more people get served this video and start watching it and so on and so on. But there's really no rhyme or reason. So mm. there's a video that, the a not short video that is the most viewed on my channel is one about, uh, I was answering some questions that someone had uh, had asked under another video. So why, why does Cambridge uh, teach functional languages? Um, okay. Well, uh, and I answer that. Uh, and... Um, and I explained that Cambridge uses a language called OCaml. Now, there seems to be uh, a community of OCaml enthusiasts. And so maybe the word OCaml in the title mm -hmm. uh, triggered some something that then uh, made YouTube think, oh, this it must be a very popular video. Let's serve it to more people and so on and so on. And it, 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 it engaged this kind of um, virtuous circle of more people viewing it because more people had viewed it. Um, but I don't think that that video was... <coughs> particularly better than many other videos that I had done in, in the same couple of months. And in, I could point out, why, why isn't this one doing even better than that? I think this one said more intelligent things than this other one. And it depends on whether it gets picked up. And I have little control over that. So yeah. all I can do, what I have control over, is making videos that I think are giving value to people. And then, uh, to some extent, I have to just stick with it until they get picked up. Is it? I'm, I'm interested in the fact that obviously you're a computer scientist and you teach it and many students who graduate from a computer science course will go into things that could involve social media mm -hmm. uh, in some ways. It's interesting you're so patient with it when I'm sure you can identify lots of frustrations with the systems, with the analytics and limitations. You seem very 
sort of calm about that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think uh, should be my reaction? <laughs> well, I, I guess I expected more frustration with how things uh, you know, become popular or are not popular, so that in some ways that you would want to change the system, if you like, having understood how it works and its limitations, that you might be, right, I want to campaign to improve this. I could do a better job about programming this or the analytics. I guess that's my... Right, yeah, well, the point is that, you know, uh, Google is run by YouTube. YouTube is a company that uh, wants to make a profit for its shareholders, uh, of which I'm one. I mean, I buy all these things. Uh, and the way they make money is uh, by selling advertising. And so what they want is just to keep people watching videos. They don't care which videos they watch. They just want mm. people to watch more videos. Mm. And they have worked hard on trying to retain uh, your eyeballs rather than you know going somewhere else, going on TikTok, happens for a bit. Uh, and they just try to cause some addiction. Mm -hmm. And... It, they don't care if it's the stupidest video in the world about, you know, putting your toes in Coca-Cola and see what happens. Uh, if it gets more views, it's more interesting than something that teaches you how the B trees work, right? And so uh, you have, a, as, a, as an author of content, you have to compete against that other stuff. There's the stuff where, you know, people burp and it gets millions of views. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's competition in a sense. Yeah. Um, and um, so... Um, I can see there are many other things that I could do to make things more popular if I wanted to play the game and if I, mm. if I were willing to go on Facebook and on Twitter and all sorts of other places and, and talk about the videos to try to attract people from other audiences. You know, there's only so many times a day. I don't care about all the other stuff. I mean, it's bad enough to <laughs> put <laughs> the time to do one video per week into YouTube. Uh, I really have no interest in going on on, on uh, Facebook and all these other platforms, even though if you wanted, if, if you did that as a business to develop a YouTube channel, you would want to have a social media strategy and all that type of bullshit. You know, I just try to um, uh, produce content that's valuable and hope that at some point it will be uh, discovered. I know that I am at the mercy of a system um, which puts forward things that bring uh, more views to, to YouTube, regardless of the content. Uh, and to some extent, I play the game. For example, I, I make the shorts, even though I don't particularly think that that's a good format for the material I'm, I'm putting forward. But if the shorts end up helping uh, bringing people to the, the real core stuff, then okay, well, welcome shorts. Uh, but there's only so far that I will go before it becomes really not interesting for me. Um, mm -hmm. And to some extent, you can see a parallel with um, the actual academic uh, output. So, you know, you, mm, we are ranked on our production of original content in terms of papers, mm -hmm. right? So you do a paper uh, and you publish it. And then uh, the paper is considered... <coughs> valuable i mean of course the venue that you publish it in of course gives some rating because some venues very very easy to publish just pay the entrance fee and you get published and some other venues are much more strict about you know referees really think that this is you know the best thing since sliced bread uh, and you know they, they cut out all the papers that don't make the grade are not sufficiently rich so in some sense the venue gives some ranking mm -hmm. to the stuff even then of the papers that are published in some highly reputable venue some of them get cited a lot by other people and some of them don't and so you can say haha if your paper gets lots of citations the citations are a bit like youtube views and if you want citations of course you have to write something that is useful is a contribution that people uh, benefit from but also you have to play some kind of game of uh, you know schmoozing people and telling them about your paper and all that stuff and some people are very much into that and doing lots of you know i've written a paper and blog post about all this stuff and lots of uh make a lot of fuss about their paper so that at least people have heard of it and some of them may be citing it on you uh, and i don't particularly 
uh, do that much of that. Uh, I had my share of papers that got you know a thousand citations, a big deal in, in, in computer science, and I have a few of those. Um, but I don't make a, a specific point of doing a lot of advertising and campaigning to drum up um, mm. uh, views, not views, uh, citations mm. on my papers. But on the other hand, when you know your promotion prospects depend on you know your H index, you've heard of the H index, yes. yeah, uh, which is a function of uh, you know citations and blah blah. Then you know people do play these games, and sure. you know, and fortunately, I'm a full professor, so I can't be promoted any higher. So I don't care about that anymore, and I can just do the things that I think are useful or important or give value. Uh, but I, I sympathize with people who are you know at uh, earlier level in their career, and they, if you don't play this game, you never get promoted. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. and it's the same with you know if, as far as YouTube channel goes. I'm the equivalent of someone who you know is just a, a postdoc who wants to become a lecturer or something like that. You know, and, uh, and if I don't, if I'm not willing to play that game, maybe I'll never be offered a lectureship. So uh, that's it. I think you've got an interesting attitude to it. It's very, I guess it's quite a healthy attitude to it, I think. Um, I'm sure lots of unexpected things have come out of this. Are there any particularly particularly unexpected things that have come out of it? Not at all, you know, any um, of the things that you we might expect, the response of students, for example, being positive, the response of some people saying, how do I get in, asking banal questions. Are there any unusual, unusual unexpected consequences? Uh, well, this is a kind of uh, anticlimactic answer, but no, I don't really think there's no. been anything particularly unusual. I mean, it, it's a lot of work. I, I kind of expected that. It's mm. been confirmed that it's uh, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It's a big time commitment. Uh, but uh, uh, I think it it puts me under a bit of pressure to uh, how to say. Uh, write something about my yeah it's all very well having ideas but if you don't put them out mm -hmm. then um, they don't do much good to anyone and so I have to express uh, what I think what I feel communicate it in a way that's effective and uh, this it's a bit like I mean with with due proportion it's a bit like poetry right if you write poetry you have to have some form I mean except modern poetry you know you write what you like and you call it poetry but uh, Classic forms of poetry, you have set, uh, you know, however many syllables, they have to rhyme and this and that. Uh, and you still have to say something that conveys your emotions, your feelings, by casting it in that form. And mm -hmm. some people might see this as uh, excessive constraints. Uh, and instead, when you start doing it, then you see that these constraints actually force you to craft your words um, much more finely than you would if you just wrote it out as a brain dump in prose. You, you, you have to refine, you have to cut this because it doesn't fit and so on. And it's actually good to cut something because, you know, what's left? What's the bit that should be left that actually matters? So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a productive, um, it, it's creative. The fact that there are extra constraints makes you more creative about fulfilling them. And it's the same here, where I know from experience that you know, if I make it much longer than 15 minutes, then nobody's gonna watch to the end. And so I write something uh, as what I want to say, and then I say, how many words is that? How many minutes would that make? And if it, if it comes to 20, 25, years, I should cut at least this much of the text, because otherwise it won't work. And so I refine, I refine, it takes a few days, uh, until I get to something that I know I can say in about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and I say, am I satisfied that did the things I wanted to say actually come across after I shrunk it as much? And if not, what other bits are fluff and what bits are core? And so that uh, kind of uh, um, helps my uh, my writing process, my expression, which is a constraint I wouldn't really have otherwise if I write a blog post or something. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I don't blog, but this thing, in a sense, is a bit like like blogging because you know you write something and then you have to say it and but you have to say it in, within the constraints of something that uh, people are going to be patient enough to watch so that's one of the core cool things you think you've learned that the constraints have been creative yeah. and helpful yeah. yeah our chat was recorded actually quite a while ago but since we recently passed 5,000 subscribers this seems like a good way for me to thank you my faithful viewers for hitting those like and subscribe buttons and sharing these videos with your friends